Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's session on um, introduction to the copyright. And um, as you can see that today's uh, session focus on copyright and publishing and the uh, main presenter today is my colleague Hannah Krago. Introductory part of today's session will focus on a brief introduction to the intellectual property rights and uh, the types of IP rights. Main session will be run by my colleague Hannah, who will talk you through to the copyright issues in the context of publishing and teaching. So it may seem uh, not very relevant, but just for information purposes, the cornerstones of modern copyright law have uh, their roots in ancient Greek, Roman, and Jewish cultures, and it can be traced back as far as the 6th century um, in ancient Greece. But the world's first copyright law was the Statute of Ain, enacted in England in 1710, and um, this act introduced for the first time the concept of the author of a work being the owner of its copyright, and it laid out fixed terms of protection. Um, intellectual property is something that you create using your mind, for example, a story, an invention, an artistic work or a symbol, and uh, types of uh, IP rights include trademarks, patents, registered designs, and um, of course the copyright. We are focusing on copyright in today's session. Uh, which is the protection offered for creative works such as books, music, um, literary works. And um, you get some types of protection automatically and for some you have to apply. And uh, before I hand over to Hannah, just to let you know that we are running a second session on copyright next week. And it is all about secondary data use. So I will put a link to the event in the chat function once I finish. So you can register for the uh, UK data service using this QR code and for our training and events using that second uh, QR code. And thank you very much. I'll hand over to Hannah. So thanks for joining us today, everyone. Um, I'm Hannah Crago um, and I'm the Open Research Development Librarian at the University of Essex. Um, and today, as Tina's already said, I'm going to be giving an introduction to copyright um, and I'm going to be focusing in the first part on copyright in publishing and some of the key considerations with copyright when you might be publishing your work. Um, then I'll be talking about copyright in teaching and some of the, the licenses and the copyright exceptions that you need to be aware of when you're developing teaching materials. Um, and then in the second half of the session, which is going to be a bit more interactive. Um, so the first two parts will be me speaking. And then we're going to go on to discuss some common copyright questions together um, and I'll be running a poll um, so you can vote on what you think to the questions and we can kind of discuss those together. And um, so hopefully you'll put some of your knowledge from the first half of the session into practice through those questions in the second part. Um, so hopefully that all sounds like what you're here for today. Um, so I will make a start. So. First of all, as I say, I'm going to be talking about copyright in publishing. Um, so when you're publishing any kind of work, um, you need to be thinking about the copyright that you have in that work or potentially don't have in that work, depending on the license terms that you sign with the publisher. But before all of that, when you're actually writing the manuscript or um, writing your work that you're going to be published, um, it's really important to consider um, that you are going to need to be sorting out all of the clearance for any third party copyright material that you might be using within your manuscript. Um, and it will be your responsibility to give appropriate attributions to any third party material you might be using. Um, so that's why copyright is really important right from the very beginning of the publishing process. And I mean by that when you're writing your manuscript. Um, so when I say about clearing copyright for third party material, the kind of material I'm talking about would be things like substantial materials. So um, images, figures, tables, graphs, that kind of thing that you might be using from a third party source. Um, those are the things that you'll need to be clearing your copyright for. So I'm not talking about quotation and um, short text extracts um, that are you know, commonplace to include within academic writing. 
These kind of aspects would follow the usual quotation and referencing format that you'll be used to, um, but we're talking about more substantial materials. So if those materials are um, published in a way where they're all works reserved, you'd need to um, ask the publisher's permission to use those works within your manuscript before you'd be able to publish. Um, if those uh, substantial works are licensed openly um, under Creative Commons licenses that I'll come to speak about later, um, then you should be able to use those just by giving the appropriate attribution. So it's really important to be careful when you're writing your manuscripts, when you're preparing your work for publication, that you're keeping a really good record of where you're getting any third party material from and that you're aware of how that material is licensed so that you know when you're publishing it that you're able to do so and that you have that permission to do so. So thinking about publishing then and copyright specifically for publishing, um, what do we mean by publishing? Well, how your research is published um, affects the copyright implications because there are different copyright agreements for different types of publications. So we could be talking about subscription-based journals, open access journals, hybrid journals, so already three different types of journal articles there, or we could be talking about books or open access monographs. Now, of course, there are other ways to publish your work, but these are the ways that I'm going to be focusing on today as they'll be the most common placed um, methods of publication um, within academia. So I'm going to go through each of these in turn now and just speak a bit about what these terms mean um, and what implications um, this has for copyright. So a subscription-based journal is your most traditional academic publication still at the moment. Um, and this would be where you write a journal article and you publish it with a journal where all content within that journal is behind a paywall, um, meaning that uh, anyone that wants to read that content either needs to be affiliated with an institution that subscribes to that journal, and therefore they need to log in usually using their university email address and passwords to get access to the full text. Or if they're not affiliated with an institution with a subscription, they can pay a fee to access individual papers. So this would be a subscription based journal It's probably the kind of journal that you're reading quite regularly. Um, and when we think about this from a published point of view and from a copyright point of view, if you're publishing a journal article within a subscription based journal, through the terms and conditions you would sign in your copyright transfer agreement with that publisher, um, you as the author would be signing over the copyright to the publisher. So um, that would mean that the publisher then is the owner of that journal article. And if you wanted to reuse any of the content in that from that journal article um, going forward, whether it be for your teaching um, or for a, a subsequent publication, you would likely have to ask the publisher's permission in order to do so, despite yourself being the author. So you as the author wouldn't have any more rights than any other reader over that paper. However, in a subscription-based journal, usually the researcher who is the author of that paper would keep the copyright to the author's accepted manuscript. So the author's accepted manuscript is the version of that journal article, the version of that paper, um, that is the final text, is the text that has been peer reviewed, um, so it's after the peer review, but it's before the journal has added all of the kind of formatting, the typesetting, all of those kind of things that make it look like that final published journal article. So as I say, usually in that copyright transfer agreement, you would sign over your rights to the final published version, the version that has been formatted, typesetted, etc. But usually you would retain the copyright over the author's accepted manuscript version. However, as it says on the slide, um, very often, if you read the copyright transfer agreements, and I would always recommend if you are publishing anything, please do read those copyright transfer agreements. Um, it's likely that within those terms and conditions, there will be restrictions there in terms of what you as the author are allowed to do with the content of the author's accepted manuscript, despite yourself being the copyright owner. Um, and very often, this will include the journals stipulating that there must be an embargo period on that author's accepted manuscript when you publish it. So what I mean by that is that when you're publishing your article, you will publish the final version of record, the published version with the publisher, and you wouldn't have the copyright to that anymore. For the author's accepted manuscript, you would usually retain copyright, 
but there would usually be a term that would say that you're only allowed to make that author's accepted manuscript publicly available um, after a certain amount of time. So that would be the embargo period. And this can often be six, 12, 18, maybe even 24 months after publication. So it allows that publisher to maintain control and kind of have the exclusive um, publication of that paper um, in the immediate term after it being published. Um, and usually after that embargo period, you can then make the author's accepted manuscript available via things like institutional repositories or subject repositories um, or other kind of uh, avenues like that. So you can see how even just in signing a, a copyright transfer agreement for a journal article in a subscription journal, which is, as I say, the most kind of traditional format of publishing academic papers, and um, there's quite a lot of layers of the copyright there. Um, I've just seen a question come through in the chat, but I think I'm going to come back to that when I've spoken a little bit more about licensing, if that's OK, and um, because I might answer that question then. But if not, I will uh, try to answer it as we get to that bit. OK, so for subscription based journals, then um, one thing to keep in mind is that I've spoken there about what the standard terms tend to be when you're publishing a journal article in a subscription journal. But some journals will allow you to request a change of the copyright agreement before you sign it um, so that you can keep all the rights to the document. So just encouraging you that when you get presented with a copyright transfer agreement, you don't have to just say yes to everything, sign and that's it. Um, it is an agreement between you both. Um, so there should be some room for manoeuvre around some of those terms and conditions. Um, it's always worth asking if there's something in an agreement that you're not happy with. Um, and remember, you could always submit your paper somewhere else if you really weren't happy with the agreement. Um, but there is also a movement at the moment within academic publishing, which is known as rights retention. Um, and this is giving power back to the author in these kind of situations. And I'm going to come on to talk about that a little bit later on. So in complete opposite to a subscription based journal, we have open access journals. So in an open access journal, all content within that journal is published openly, which means that anyone who has access to the internet can read the full text of that journal article without needing to pay and without needing to have any subscriptions or any logins or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's really open to read those papers. Um, and what that means from a copyright um, perspective for the author is that as the author of a paper within an open access journal, um, you would keep all rights to the work, um, including the final published version. Um, so you are you um, maintain control over that work and you remain the copyright owner of your own journal article when publishing in an open access journal. Um, what you then give the publisher um, and what the, the agreement you would sign with the publisher in this situation would be that the journal is then getting a license to publish that paper. Um, so, yes, in terms of uh, the question in the Q&A, um, the question is copyright transfer versus licensing your copyrighted work. Wouldn't licensing be more beneficial to researchers slash authors and do the journals require copyright transfer? Um, I am quite biased because I spend a lot of my time working on open access, um, but I would say, agree with uh, the question that no journals shouldn't require copyright transfer. And yes, licensing is more beneficial to researchers and authors. Um, the reason that subscription journals require copyright transfer is so that they can maintain control of that paper and therefore sell the rights to access that paper effectively through subscriptions. Um, so they want to have the copyright transfer so that they know that the only way anyone can read that paper is to subscribe to their journal. Um, whereas if you're publishing open access, you maintain control of it and you can share that paper in other places as well, such as on social media or uh, within um, ResearchGate or something along those kind of lines. You would keep control of it and then you are just licensing um, the publisher to publish it in their journal on your behalf. Um, and again, there might be specific terms in that, um, but usually when you're publishing in an open access journal, it will be a non-exclusive right. Uh, a non-exclusive license to publish that work for the publisher. Um, so I hope that's answered the question in the Q&A there, but do um, 
follow up in the chat um, if there was anything to follow up on that. Yes, so yes, as it says in the chat, uh, licensing is more beneficial to the authors um, and keep copyright to the work if possible. Yes, perfectly summarised. And we're going to come back to that concept in a moment when I speak about rights retention as well. So keep that in mind. So the third way that you can publish um, a journal article is to publish in a hybrid journal. Um, so a hybrid journal, as the name suggests, is a mixture between an open access journal and a subscription based journal. Um, so effectively, it is a subscription based journal, but it has the option for open access for single articles. So most of the content or some of the content within that journal um, will still be behind a paywall. You still need to subscribe to access that content, but individual authors can choose to pay um, a fee to make their one individual paper available open access. So that would be a, a hybrid journal. Um, if you are publishing open access within a hybrid journal, um, then a Creative Commons license, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, will be attached to that work as it would be for when publishing in a fully open access journal. And again, like with an open access journal, all the copyright would remain with the author. Um, so if you're paying to make your paper available open access within a hybrid journal, um, you would have the same copyright situation as you would if you were publishing in a fully open access journal. However, if you're publishing traditionally um, in a hybrid journal, so you're not paying for open access to publish in that hybrid journal, um, just like when publishing in a full subscription journal, the copyright is usually transferred to the journal. So in a hybrid journal, you basically are just either doing the open access route or the subscription route. Um, it's just that you get to choose between those within that same journal. So if you're publishing in an open access journal or if you're paying for open access within a hybrid journal, um, you would be putting a Creative Commons license on your journal article. Um, and there are several different elements to a Creative Commons license. Um, and when you're publishing your paper or when you're publishing your monograph, because it would be the same for books and the same for chapters, you as the copyright owner would get to choose which license you are assigning to your work. Now, it might be that your publisher um, has a default license or has a license that they recommend. But again, it would be up to you as the copyright owner to decide which license to go for. Um, and I should say that once you have chosen a license um, and once that license has been assigned to that output, um, it cannot be changed. And um, so I'd really encourage you to think carefully about the kind of level of restriction you would like to place on your work um, before choosing one of these licenses. Um, so there's different elements that can be added to the license. So I've got the four different elements here on the slide um, with the definitions of what these are, and you can combine these in different ways. Um, so the least restrictive Creative Commons license is a CC BY license, um, which is a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, and this is the most common within academia. It's the license that is recommended um, or not even recommended. It's the license that is required by lots of research funders. So UKRI, for example, um, requires CC BY unless there's a particular reason for output not to be licensed CC BY. And what this license means is that any kind of reuse is allowed of that work that's been published openly with a CC BY license as long as the author or the licensor gets credit, so attribution for that work. Um, so attribution is fundamental to um, scholarly communications. Um, we all know about referencing, um, and this is just ensuring that um, attribution is given to the copyright holder, which would normally be the author. Um, you can then add these different elements if you want to put more restrictions on your work. Um, so CC BY SA, which stands for share alike, um, this would mean that licensees are allowed to distribute a modified version of the work. And um, so you could um, reuse the work in whichever way you like. Um, but the new work that you were distributing that made use of the previously licensed work um, must be under the same or not more restrictive license as the original work. So if something had a CC by SA license and I was making a modified version of it. I could publish that modified version under a CC by SA or CC by license but not under a an all rights reserved license because that would be more restrictive. Um, that one doesn't tend to be used too much in academia, um, but it is still one to be aware of. 
Um, the elements that are more commonly added within um, academia would be the NC and ND elements. Um, NC is non-commercial, so it means that reuse is allowed, but that reuse cannot be for commercial purposes. Um, and sometimes people do like to add this element to prevent someone else commercialising their research. Um, and then the ND element means no modifications allowed. Um, and this is more common within arts and humanities, um, where people might want their work to be reused, but they wouldn't want their artistic work or their work to be modified in any way. Um, so a fairly common licence um, for, again, usually within arts and humanities, um, would be a CC BY NC ND licence. So incorporating that attribution element, as well as the non-commercial and the no derivatives um, aspect. Um, but it's still CC BY, which is the most common. Um, it's the most open of the licences that are used within academia. Um, and I just would encourage you, when you're thinking about which licence to choose, to think about what that actually means in practice. Um, so, for example, if you were to put a no derivatives license on, it would mean that people couldn't make a translated version of your work, for example, in another language um, without coming to you and asking your permission. Um, and similarly, a non-commercial license could have um, unforeseen effects, such as someone might not be able to present about your work at a conference where they were being paid to present, for example. Um, so in some situations, these elements might be important and might be necessary. Um, but do just think about potentially the um, consequences that you might not have thought about by adding these more restrictive elements as well. I should also just say at this point, um, because you might already be aware of this license and are wondering why I haven't spoken about it, there is also a CC0 license. Um, and when something has a CC0 license, it means that it's in the public domain um, and it can be reused without even needing to give attribution. Um, but this license doesn't tend to be used for academia or academic publishing, um, which is why I uh, haven't included it on the slide here. Um, would presenting at a conference also be a derivative work? Um, it depends on what they were doing with that with that kind of presentation. If you were just using an image from a, a CC BY um, NC uh, publication, for example, um, and putting that within your um, within your presentation slides, for example, at a conference that wouldn't necessarily be termed a derivative work of the original, it would just be using a part of that. Um, but yes, it could be if you were present doing a conference presentation about someone's whole research article, um, then yes, that would then be a derivative work. So it just kind of depends on what that use is there. And um, hopefully that answers the question, Alice, in the chat. Okay, so I mentioned already about rights retention and about authors being able to maintain control over um, papers. Um, so I'm going to talk now a bit about that in more detail. So we've spoken about open access and Creative Commons licenses and how publishing open access allows authors to maintain um, control over their papers and to retain copyright over their publications. Um, so funders, research funders, for example, UKRI, um, but lots of other research funders are increasingly asking for open access publication. Um, and this is primarily because um, publicly funded research should be openly available for the public to read. Um, so amongst lots of other reasons. Um, but with that, um, there comes implications for copyright if more and more research uh, is being published open access. Um, so funders are increasingly asking for open access publication, as I say, um, and this can mean that authors are publishing more in open access journals or are paying for open access within hybrid journals. Um, but um, not all authors have the funds available um, to pay to publish, um, which a lot of open access journals do require. Um, and also it might just be that the journal you want to publish in, the one that is the best academic home for your research, might not offer open access publication um, in that way. Um, so funders aren't wanting to restrict where their authors can publish their work um, because it's still important to make sure those articles are going to the most appropriate journal. So with that in mind, um, there needed to be another way for authors to ensure that they could have immediate open access um, within subscription-based journals and hybrid journals where they didn't want to or weren't able to pay for open access publication. Um, 
So I mentioned already that often when you're publishing um, in a subscription journal or behind a paywall in a hybrid journal, um, that publishers often stipulate that even though the authors um, keep control of the author's accepted manuscript or are given control of the author's accepted manuscript through the copyright transfer agreement is more accurate. Um, often publishers say that there must be an embargo period before that paper can be made available openly. But as funders are increasingly asking for immediate open access on publication, this is a problem. Um, and so because of that, rights retention has been developed to ensure that authors can make their author's accepted manuscript, so that version post peer review, but before all the journal formatting and typesetting, can make that version immediately available open access through a repository um, without any embargo period. So the trouble with this is that there would then be a mismatch between the journal policy and the funders policy. So for example, a journal will say, um, yes, we're gonna publish your paper. You sign this copyright transfer agreement where we will give you control of the author's accepted manuscript, but you can't make that available until 12 months after publication. At the same time, your funder is saying to you, you must make your paper available immediately open access on publication. So there's this mismatch between the two that puts authors in a really difficult position um, and it makes it very difficult to satisfy both of those terms. So that's why rights retention has been developed to get rid of this situation and empower authors and um, to keep control of their authors accepted manuscript. So all rights retention is, is this short statement you can see here on the slide um, that authors can put on their manuscripts when they submit to journals, and it must be when they submit to the journal, um, because you are then telling the publisher, you're telling the journal, as the statement says, for the purpose of open access, you as the author have applied a CC BY, so Creative Commons Attribution, public copyright license to any author's accepted manuscript version arising from this submission. So you tell the journal or the publisher that when you submit to that um, journal. So the journal knows this before they've put any work into the publication of the paper um, and before you have signed anything with the publisher. You're then putting a, what's called a prior license on the author's accepted manuscript version. So you are already licensing that author's accepted manuscript before it exists. You are licensing it as a, under a CC BY license. And I already mentioned once something has been licensed in one way, the, the license cannot be changed. Um, and so what this means is even if the journal policy um, stipulates later on that uh, the author's accepted manuscript can't be shared until 12 months after publication, um, this license, this prior license will overrule any copyright transfer agreement terms and conditions that you are signing um, that uh, the journal stipulates. So using rights retention means that you as the author keep control of that author's accepted manuscript from the very beginning. It means that instead of you signing everything over and then the author giving you back the rights to the author's accepted manuscript with these added terms and conditions, what you're actually doing is keeping control of that author's accepted manuscript and never signing that over to the publisher, even if you're signing the version of record over to the publisher. So in practical terms, that means that you can make that author's accepted manuscript available via a repository immediately on publication or even beforehand um, because it's yours to share and use in the way that you see fit. Um, so it's a really powerful um, thing. It really helps with enabling open access and ensuring that all uh, research outputs that are at the moment, primarily this is just used for journal articles, um, can be made immediately available, open access and shared and reused, even if the final published versions aren't. Um, and this is a real growing movement within the UK especially, and lots of institutions, lots of universities are bringing in institutional rights retention policies. That means that all of their authors, journal articles usually still just at the moment, um, have this already there. So institutions are kind of contacting publishers um, that they know that their research is published with a lot um, and telling them that this is the case and that their authors are going to be retaining rights over their authors accepted manuscripts, licensing them CC BY. Um, and it's kind of a blanket um, policy there that means that 
the onus is off authors having to remember to add this to their publications. Um, cool. I was just reading the uh, the comment in the chat. Um, you're very welcome. And yes, it is. It's really important, and it's a really important movement in in scholarly communications at the moment, and something that is important for uh, academics and researchers and authors generally to understand. So hopefully that does all make sense. Um, but if anyone does have any questions on that, please do feel free to add them to the Q&A or to the chat. Okay, so I've spoken a lot so far about journal articles. Um, so what I'm gonna speak a bit about now is uh, books, monographs, chapters, those kind of things, um, because copyright transfer does work slightly differently. Um, for these long form um, outputs. So usually um, when you're publishing a book or a monograph, um, usually the publisher will ask the author to assign certain rights to the publisher in different ways. So there's three main ways that this tends to work with books. Um, I'd say that uh, the copyright transfer agreements for uh, books or copyright agreements contracts really is what we're calling for books. Um, do vary a bit more publisher to publisher than they tend to for journal articles but in essence there's kind of these three levels of of them um, of rights that work with with monograph publishing so um the first is where you would just assign copyright to the publisher so like with the the subscription journal article you as the author assign full rights over to the publisher the publisher would now own that work and um, but the author usually gets royalties or payments for the sale of of that work and those the terms of those royalties will be written into the contract. Um, the second is you uh, assign exclusive rights. Um, so the author would keep the copyright to the work, um, but is not allowed to publish or disseminate that work anywhere else than with that publisher of which they're signing that contract with. Um, so you would still be listed as the copyright owner. So within the copyright page of the book, it would say, uh, it would have the, the copyright logo, you know, the Orwich Reserve logo and your name, um, but it would be that you were not allowed to publish or disseminate the work anywhere else. And that that publisher has therefore got the exclusive rights to, to share that work. The third is non-exclusive rights, and this would be uh, less common, but this could be where, again, the author would keep the copyright and they'd be able to disseminate that work in other, in other ways, um, but usually republishing wouldn't be allowed. So dissemination could be um, sharing extracts on social media or um, you know smaller extracts or putting a chapter within a repository, that kind of thing. Um, but you wouldn't normally be allowed in a non-exclusive rights agreement to republish the whole work with a different publisher. Um, so the terms tend to vary for, for books and monographs more so than with journal articles because the way that uh, books are sold and um, differs so much to, to journal articles and subscriptions in that way. Open access monographs also exist. Um, so similarly to the open access journal articles that we've uh, discussed already, um, open access monographs and um, books and chapters generally are a bit behind um, open access journal articles, but um, funders are now asking for open access monograph publishing as well. Um, so for UKRI, for example, um, long form publications that are funded do now also need to be made available open access, um, but it isn't immediate open access at the moment for long form publications. So there is still a 12 month embargo period permitted uh, for monographs, but that doesn't mean that there has to be an embargo period. Increasingly, monograph publishers are offering um, open access. And similarly to um, articles, in most cases, this will involve payment. So the payment of a book processing charge. Um, but there are um, publishers of monographs that are developing. And there are several now um, where there's no direct author facing fee. Um, so you can publish your monograph open access um, with, a, with a publisher that works on kind of a not-for-profit basis um, where there's kind of supporter costs from institutions and other funders that keep the publisher going so that authors don't have to pay the individual fees to make their work available open access. Um, but with, in terms of copyright, the open access uh, monographs situation would be very much the same as journal articles. You would publish your open access monograph uh, under a CC license. Again, one of those licenses we've already discussed. Um, and for books and chapters, 
the NC and D elements are probably more uh, common than under than for journal articles. Um, so hopefully that kind of shows how publishing and copyright are really interlinked. Um, and we might think open access publishing and um, subscription publishing are quite separate to copyright, but understanding the copyright implications of the way that you're publishing your outputs and understanding what those copyright terms mean when you're signing those agreements um, are really important for understanding how your work's going to be reused, shared um, further down the line. Okay, so that's everything I'm going to talk to you today about for publishing for now. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about teaching um, and how copyright affects teaching um, before we go on to the interactive part of the session. Um, so when we're thinking about teaching, copyright affects what can be used in teaching materials um, and it also affects um, what can be included on online reading lists. So a lot of the time when we're thinking about teaching, we're thinking about those presentation slides we might be using um, and we're also thinking about sharing extracts or whole texts on online reading lists or virtual learning environments. Um, so these are the two aspects I'm going to be focusing on over the next few slides. Um, I've just seen a question. So would data repositories also be a form of publishing for data and the supporting materials? Will you talk about that as well and the agreements and licenses around that? Um, data repositories, yes, would be a form of publishing. Um, and this is definitely something that's important. Open data would work in a similar kind of way to open access publication with the different licenses. Um, and there are data repositories that tend to be, as you've said in the question, that tend to be where data is, is published. Um, I'm not going to speak about that specifically today, um, but Hina, who introduced the session, is running a session next week on copyright for secondary data and those sorts of things. Um, and she will be uh, someone who can answer questions about those kind of aspects. So if you aren't already signed up to that session, I'd encourage you to, to sign up to that one next week as well. OK, so thinking about teaching then. Um, when it comes to teaching, um, especially within UK higher education setting, um, we tend to use licenses quite a lot to enable us to um, use teaching materials and reading list materials in a way that is copyright compliant. Um, so one of the main licenses that we use for teaching within higher education in the UK is the CLA license, so the Copyright Licensing Agency license um, for higher education. So lots of uh, academic institutions within the UK will have one of these licenses. Um, and these licenses uh, cover the copying of extracts from books, journals and magazines. Um, so they make it easier for institutions to reuse content for teaching. So for materials that are covered by the, the license, because it won't be every single book, journal and magazine that's ever been published, um, though it is a, a large selection, um, what the license enables you to do is it enables copying of up to 10% of the work um, or one chapter, um, whichever is greater, or one article from one issue of a, a journal. Um, so these copies can be shared with students or staff within the institution, and that is important. It does have to be restricted um, just to students and staff at that institution. Um, and because of that, um, the copies made under the terms of this license are usually hosted within online reading systems or virtual learning environments that are password protected to ensure that only staff and students at the university can access them. And also what the CLA license requires or what the CLA requires is that all uh, copies made under the terms of this license are reported to the Copyright Licensing Agency um, to ensure that there is, is compliance there. So um, here at the University of Essex, the way we manage this is that any copies of materials that are made under our CLA license have to be hosted via our um, online reading list system. We use Talis Aspire, um, and it's through that platform that we're able to report all of those materials to the CLA on an annual basis. Um, and I would expect that will be similar across uh, different institutions. Um, and this license is really fundamental because it does allow for much greater and much easier um, copying of materials than would otherwise uh, be permitted under standard UK copyright law. Um, so this license is really important for enabling students 
um, to access more materials um, than they would otherwise be able to. Um, for example, if you had a, a print book in the library um, and it wasn't available as an ebook, um, but you wanted a specific chapter to be read for a module, um, you could make a copy of that chapter, post it on your reading list um, and report it to the CLA as long as that book were covered by the CLA license. And it would then mean that all of your um, students on your module could then read that chapter rather than them all fighting over that one print book in the library. So it is really important, um, but it also means that the copyright owner, um, so the author of that book is getting, um, is not being taken advantage of by things just being copying, um, copied. Um, okay, so for another license that we can make use of um, is the ERA license for higher education. So this is the Educational Recording Agency license. Um, and it's kind of similar to the CLA license, but uh, this um, license is used for uh, recordings and television broadcasts um, and uh, radio programs and, and things like that. So. What it means is that staff and students can record or make use of copies of, of programmes for educational use. And um, so the educational use aspect is really important here. Um, so we can't just be making recordings or copies of programmes for entertainment or certainly not for any commercial activity. Um, but where the materials are needed to be used for education, for teaching, um, this licence allows um, these programs or clips to be shared on virtual learning environments, on online reading lists, um, embedded in presentations, um, shown in classrooms, those kind of things. Um, the the license can be used in, in different ways, but uh, here at the University of Essex at least, um, the main way we make use of our ERA, ERA license is um, allowing us to subscribe to Box of Broadcasts or Bob. Um, on box of broadcast, uh, TV programmes and films that have been broadcast within the UK um, are made available via that database um, and we're able to make use of those because of our ERA licence. Um, so that tends to be the way that uh, UK institutions make use of that licence. Um, but some institutions don't have these licences um, or some material is not always covered by these licences. Um, and in these cases, there are copyright exceptions within UK copyright law that can be taken advantage of um, in order to still allow for uh, students and staff to make use of um, materials that is protect that are protected by copyright. Um, so generally, um, the, the main copyright exception that we would use for teaching is section 32. Um, and this is termed as illustration for instruction. Um, so illustration for instruction um, basically means that you can reuse content um, under the terms of fair dealing for illustration within a, a teaching setting or an educational setting. Um, there are a few really important points here. So again, it must be for instruction. It must be for educational purposes um, where you're referring to Section 32 as a way to uh, permit the reuse of that work. Um, it also must be a purely non-commercial activity, so that kind of ties in with it being uh, for education. Um, but as with everything with copyright, and um, as we'll come to see in the second half of the session, there is a certain element of interpretation around this copyright exception. For example, I've already said, you know, it must be a non-commercial use and that therefore translates to education. Um, but there are discussions that really at universities we are charging our students quite a lot of money uh, to study at universities. Um, so can we really say it's a non-commercial activity? Uh, the general consensus is that yes, we can. And education within higher education can be deemed as a non-commercial activity because universities are still not for profit. And um, so that is still an OK use under that exception. Um, there's also been some discussion in the past around the for instruction aspect of this exception. Um, because previously there was some interpretation that this meant it could only be used where materials were being used for in-class instruction. Um, but now, especially since COVID, but even beforehand, uh, the general agreement is that online platforms like virtual learning environments and online reading lists are an essential part of teaching and effectively an extension of the classroom. And therefore, 
um, using the materials on those platforms is still deemed as fair um, and still deemed as for instruction and for education. But I've put here the usual fair dealing questions apply because when we're thinking about copyright exceptions within the UK, we are thinking under the terms of fair dealing um, and general questions that we ask ourselves within my team when we ask copyright questions would be, is what you're using under one of these copyright exceptions um, directly relevant to what is being taught? If the answer is yes, you could probably say it would be fair in that situation. If the answer is no, um, then maybe need to reconsider. Similarly, we could think, are we reproducing an unreasonable proportion of the original? Um, copying chapters upon chapters out of the same book would probably not be deemed as fair. So we want to be thinking about only making copies of the exact part of the text that is really essential to the message that you're trying to teach within your session. Um, is the usage really a replacement for purchasing additional copies? Um, again, this is something to keep in mind um, if, you know, we're thinking about whether the reuse is fair or not. Could it damage the interests of the copyright owner in some other way? Um, have we acknowledged the author and the source adequately? All of these kind of things are good questions to ask yourself if you're making use of a copyright exception. And a really good rule of thumb and really the thing that I think is most important to take away from this is put yourself in the position of the owner of the copyright and think if you were that owner, if you were the author of that copyright, for example, and the author of that work, sorry, would you be happy with your work being reused in that way? In the first part of the session, we were thinking as if we were authors and thinking about authors keeping control of their copyright and being in control of how their work's being reused and shared. So when we're thinking about teaching, if we can uh, flip that background and imagine it's your work being reused, and um, then that can normally be a good way to kind of assess whether it would be deemed a fair use, whether you would be happy for your work to be reused in that way. Um, but generally, I've got here when in doubt, get in touch. Of course, anyone's uh, very welcome to email me after. But if you're not from the University of Essex, um, the chances are you will have someone within your university um, who deals with these kind of questions more frequently. Um, so with copyright dis decisions, it can always be good to get a second opinion. Um, within my team, we often speak to each other to go just to get a second opinion, see what other people would think. Um, because there is that element of interpretation to a lot of copyright decisions. Um, so, so do talk about the, um, your decisions and um, do discuss with your copyright experts at your university or wherever you are based. Um, because sometimes it does just take those conversations to have that kind of rationale out there um, to, to see um, what, the, what the consensus would be on those situations. So with all of that in mind, um, I wanted to move on to a more interactive part of the session um, because copyright is not always straightforward um, and there are lots of things that we can discuss around copyright. So I thought what we could do for the remainder of the session is I've got some of the most frequent questions that we get asked within my team around copyright and um, that we can try and answer together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a question on the slide um, and then going to launch a poll within Zoom. Um, where there will just be three answers for every question and it will either be yes, no, or it depends. Um, so for each question, you can just select whether you think the answer is yes, no, or it depends and put any of your reasoning or your rationale in the chat. Or if you would prefer to, be more than happy for you to unmute and speak. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to just put your, your thoughts in the chat as well, that would be great. We can have a bit of a discussion between us on what we think about those questions. So first question then, um, do I own the rights to my PhD? So I'm just going to launch the poll now. Um, okay. So hopefully you can all see that that now. So you should see that there are just three, three options there. So yes, no, what it depends. So do I own the rights to my PhD? So imagine you're a PhD student, do you own the rights to your PhD? And if you have any any thoughts or reasonings or rationale to your answers, feel free to put that in the chat. I'll just give you a couple of seconds to, to answer. <laughs> 
Okay, so I will end the poll and share the results. Um, so we can see that we've got majority of people have said it depends. Quite a lot of people have said yes and a couple of no's. Um, and I can see some uh, responses coming through the chat as well. Depends on the university policy um, and the reuse of others' work. I think the institution owns the right to the PhD, but might be wrong. It depends. Research data is often owned by institution. It depends how the PhD is funded. Um, the writing could be copyrighted to the author. It depends on third party materials. So um, we're going to come back to third party materials in a moment. So it's really great to see you guys already thinking about those kind of aspects. Um, in terms of the PhD yourself, um, it would depend on the university policy. Um, but um, generally, um, PhD students do own the rights to their PhD. I can't say that at every institution that is the case, um, but in lots of situations it will be. Um, and that will be because um, PhD students are paying as students to be there at the university um, and therefore they own the rights to their PhD in most situations. But the third party material um, may be uh, slightly different. So with um, we'll go with that in mind, we'll go on to the next question. So I'll relaunch the poll again. Um, can I use images I don't own in my PhD thesis? So imagine you've got some images that you've found online, um, you found in another uh, another publication or on a website. Um, can you own those images you don't own in your PhD thesis? And again, great to see some comments coming through in the chat. Please do keep them coming. Just give you a couple of seconds more to answer. Okay, um, so we've got a couple of yeses and lots of it depends for that. So um, questions coming through in the chat. So uh, yes, as long as you get copyright clearance, yes, with permission or CC license. Depends on the license of the images, depending on how others images are licensed. If you get permission, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So I can see loads of these things going through. Um, you can get clearance if the paper gets published in journals, it can be harder to clear copyright for use in those. Yes, so um, the trick here with this one is that within your PhD thesis, if you are not publishing it, um, there is a copyright exception for education and reuse, um, education and research, sorry. That means you can use a reasonable amount of another person's work, even if it isn't openly licensed and even without permission, um, as long as it is properly cited because it would be for education and research. Um, however, all of those answers you've just given in the chat, so I won't make you vote again on this one because it is uh, similar. Um, can I use the images I used in my research in my publication? So all of those things we've said there in terms of depends on the license of the, the images, depends on whether you've got permission or it's a CC license, that would all then become relevant to if you were going on to publish your PhD. Um, so when you're publishing your thesis, and um, there's different copyright considerations to if you are just submitting your thesis for the purpose of being assessed for your degree. Um, so what we usually recommend um, is that um, all of our PhD students, we recommend that they would clear the copyright for all of those um, third party materials anyway, and um, without just relying on that copyright exception, um, because generally PhD theses do tend to be shared um, and I've just seen Sarah has written in the chat, theses are all made available online, potentially after embargo period. Would you count this as publishing? I would say yes, that that would be counted as publishing if it's being made openly available via a repository. So if it's being made available in a repository under a CC license, which often they are, um, then I would say that this counts as publication. And I wouldn't want to then just be relying on that copyright exception. I'd want to know that those third party materials were either openly licensed or the permission had been cleared. So while there is that copyright exception, um, it does sometimes lead to, if you've relied on that copyright exception, when you then go on to make your thesis publicly available and publishing it, um, that you might have to redact some of those materials. So we tend to recommend that um, PhD students clear the copyright or use CC licensed materials within their thesis to avoid that becoming a problem further down the line. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so the next question then, 
Um, can I reuse content from work I have published before? So yes, no, it depends. So imagine you've written a journal article um, and now you're writing a monograph um, and you want to use some of the content from that journal article within your monograph. Um, can you reuse that? So some more comments coming through in the chat as well. Um, you guys are getting quick on answering. Um, which is really great. Um, so I'll end the poll now. Um, and we have some consensus this time. Um, so everyone has says it depends. So yes, you're catching on here that uh, copyright often, it does depend. Often there are gray areas. So yes, it depends on the copyright transfer agreement sign. Depends if you transfer the copyright to a journal. Um, exactly. It depends on if you've, if you've published open access or not. So yes, if you have signed the copyright over to the publisher, you would need to ask that publisher's permission. Um, but if you are, if you've published open access previously, then, or if you still own the copyright to that content, then you would be able to use it. Um, but in either cases, um, make sure you self cite um, because you still don't want to be looking at self plagiarism, which I can just see has also been added to the chat. Um, so, yes, you would still need to self cite um, whichever situation it was. Um, but it does depend on how the previous work has been published. Um, okay, so the next question then. Um, can I reuse figures from my publication um, or figures from my published work in my future work? So a fairly similar question here. Um, uh, Yes, so the difference between the Q&A, can you please explain the difference between reusing with attribution and citing? So this is really, it's quite a fine distinction, um, but when we're thinking about reusing content, we're thinking about reusing a substantial amount of a con of, of a work. Um, so it might be a, a large body of text or reusing an image or a, a graph or um, reusing the whole premise of, of a paper or a, a whole methodology, for example in a research study. Um, whereas when we're thinking about citing, um, it would just be kind of standard as you do in academia when you're writing a paper, citing a person's idea or citing a particular theory or um, a particular concept. So um, reusing would be when you're reusing a substantial part, you would need to get um, permission or clear the copyright and you need proper attribution. For citing, um, it would just be taking a small extract and and being critical of that or analysing it or um, referencing it in that way. And that would always require a reference. Um, hopefully that makes that distinction a bit clearer. I know that it is quite a grey kind of area to make that distinction really obvious. But OK, um, so this one then on the figures. Um, so I will end the poll and share the results. So we've got lots of it to pen and a few yeses. Um, so yes, because figures and info rather than a chunk directly taken from previous work, so you can reuse them to make new graphs. Um, so I would say that it depends here, um, similarly to the previous question. So it depends whether your figures, um, whether you still own the copyright to those figures or not. Um, so if you've been, the only way you've published a figure or um, a graph, for example, is within a publication where you've signed the copyright over, then just like with any of your other work, um, you would need to ask the publisher's permission to use that. Um, whereas if you had um, published that figure openly, then you would still own the copyright. The reason I've drawn out figures separately to the previous question is because I wanted to highlight um, the importance of platforms such as Figshare um, that you can use to effectively publish individual figures or individual aspects of your, your data or your research um, openly available. Um, so you could publish a, if you've made a table or a graph, for example, um, you might just add that individual figure to Figshare um, and then license it under a Creative Commons license. It's attributed to you. It's got its own DRI. Um, then when you reuse that in your publication, you would cite that openly available source. So you'd be citing your own figure that is published openly um, and you'd then be able to reuse it in your in your publication. And then if you were to sign the copyright over to that article, 
that figure and would still be licensed separately. So you would then retain control over that. It would mean if you wanted to use those figures in teaching or in um, future publications or in conference presentations, anything like that, you'd still own the copyright to that figure. So platforms such as Figshare can be really helpful for keeping control over aspects like that. Um, yes, yeah, so the question, Jade, if you have published a figure the first time in an open access journal, reused in a subscription journal, is further reused but others now restricted? No, um, because they could, that figure that you then reused in a subscription journal, that individual figure would still be openly licensed within the original open access journal, so they'd be able to reuse it from that original place. Um, so it's not like if you publish it again in a more restrictive way, it locks down the original. Um, so you'd still be able to use that. Um, if the graphs are created by the publisher and created, you may need permission. Yes. So, yes, exactly. So if you created a graph, first of all, before you published it um, and put it in Figshare, it would be fine. But if the publisher had kind of created the figure for you um, and they owned the copyright to that figure, then yes, you could create a new figure from your data, um, assuming you still own the data. So yeah, thank you for highlighting that as well. Okay, so the next question then, thinking a bit more about teaching. Um, so can I put my reading materials on a virtual learning environment? So here at Essex, we use Moodle, uh, but you might use a different learning environment. Uh, so, so can you put uh, your reading materials on a virtual learning environment? So thinking about the copies you might make, scans, uh, those kind of things. Okay, we've got uh, a few different answers coming in. Um, so we've got, it depends on the volume of materials distributed and their license, um, or we've got reference to the exception for instruction. Um, so if I share the results of this one. Um, so we've got, uh, mostly it depends, uh, a few yeses and one no. So I would say that this does depend. Um, it will vary by institution, um, but if you're making copies under the terms of the Copyright Licensing Agency license, the CLA license, if your institution has a CLA license, um, then yes, you would be able to make them available, but there would need to be a mechanism in place for reporting these. So you'd need to check with your readiness team or your copyright advisor if your institution has a CLA license and how those scans are reported. So it might be that instead of putting them on a virtual learning environment, you need to put them on an online reading list system. Um, but aside from that distinction, um, if you didn't have a CLA license or if you were making a copy of a work that wasn't covered by the CLA license, um, then you wouldn't need to report it in the same way. Um, but then Alice's point here about the exception for instruction you could make use of that exception, um, but you would need to be thinking about all of those fair dealing aspects and you would likely only be able to use a smaller amount of that material um, than is allowed under the CLA license. So it's kind of a, it depends situation. And yes, it depends on the volume of the materials um, and the license. So if um, they are um, open access materials, then um, you would be able to share them. But exactly as the, Final comment is just said in the chat. If the university has a subscription to the journal, then I would say yes, it's always better to link to the article um, rather than adding a PDF copy or um, you know scanning a print copy. Although I don't think that would exist much anymore for, for journal articles. But yes, if you've already got access via online platforms, via subscriptions or via eBooks um, at Essex, at least we always recommend people add that content to their reading list via links. Um, rather than making copies um but the copies are more for if you've only got them in print and you need to make scans um is how that would work more okay so the next question then um i wrote the chapter so i can do whatever i like with the full text um so again yes no or it depends Some of these final ones, you might be feeling far too much like copyright experts at this point to, to uh, be tripped up by them. But these are questions we do get asked quite a lot. 
Okay, um, so I'll end the poll now. Uh, so we've got one yes, uh, lots of no's, and even more, it depends. Um, so it would be, yes, it depends. So it depends whether you own the copyright or not, which as you can see is a common theme here. And you can see why uh, retaining copyright over your own um, over your own works and um, make all of these kind of situations much more straightforward. Um, so yes, so as ever, it depends on the agreement with the other authors, which is also a good point, um, and the publisher. Um, so if you own the copyright, then you should be able to share the chapter. Um, but if you don't, then you would need to be abiding by the terms that you had signed. Um, and just seeing Keith Eleganto is a good tool for preparing reading lists using links from institutional promo. Yes, so Eleganto is a, another read, online reading list system that works in a similar way to Talis Aspire, which is what we use at Essex. So there are several of those and they do allow for um, embedding materials from your uh, library discovery systems in a really uh, straightforward way. Okay, so the next question then um, is freely available online so I can share it with my students. Uh, so yes, no, or it depends. So you've come across uh, some material online, it's freely available, um, so you can share it on your reader list or email it to your students or add it to your virtual learning environment. Okay, uh, so we've got mostly uh, it depends and a few yeses. Um, best practices linked to the original. Free doesn't mean open access, so not necessarily, but again, instruction, yes. Um, so yes, the best practice would be to link to the original, um, but exactly, free doesn't net always mean open access. Free doesn't always mean license under a Creative Commons license. Free doesn't always mean legitimate. Um, so not all freely available materials online are legitimate. If something has been illegally uploaded um, and it's obvious that it has been illegally uploaded online, um, generally we wouldn't be uh, directing our students to this source. Um, but equally at the same time, um, it is very difficult. We cannot police the entire internet and um, none of us would be able to do that. Um, but we want to be directing our students to legitimate sources um, wherever possible. And this kind of goes back to that keeping the copyright owner's best intentions in mind as well. Uh, okay, next question then. We're getting, we've only got a couple more now. Um, so I only want to use a few pages, so it's fine to scan and share. So imagine you've got a print book. You want to use a, free page, a few pages of this in your teaching um, on your reading list. Um, it's fine to scan if it's just a few pages. Okay. Uh, is it covered by the CLA agreement? Sounds okay from CLA license and fair dealing. Uh, yes, so um, we've got mostly it depends this time, which I would agree with. So yes, if it's covered by, so it does depend, if it's covered by the CLA agreement, as we've said in the chat, um, then this should be okay um, or would be okay. Um, if it isn't covered by the agreement, it's more likely that it would be able to fall under the, the copyright exception under the terms of fair dealing with it only being a few pages. So thinking about that, are we using a proportionate amount? Um, are we only using what we need for instruction? Um, and are we um, substituting the making the copies for purchasing additional copies? If it's only a few pages, all of those are likely to be seen as more fair. So it's usually better um, for um, if you're just using a small amount. But yes, so it would depend on the purpose of sharing. If it's to sell or for clear commercial use of it, it wouldn't be okay, no. So all of those fair dealing elements would come into it um, if it wasn't under the terms of the CLA licence. And yes, uh, also in the chat, it does depend on the total length too. Um, under the CLA licence, for example, you can share 10% or one chapter, whichever is greater. So if it was only four pages of a 10 page work, obviously that would be more than 10%. Um, so yes. Um, 
and where the sharing is yes so again if you're putting it in a, a, a password protected platform um then that would again be more likely to be seen as a fair reuse okay so i think this is the second last one um so it's very old so copyright doesn't apply so this isn't necessarily something we've covered already in the session today um so we'll see see what thoughts we have have here so it depends on how old very old is <laughs> good point uh alice says it might be out of copyright presumably we still need to report the use if it's scanned or similar for a VLE. okay so I'll share the results. So um, yes, it, it would depend in this situation. So most people have put it depends. So under UK copyright law, um, 70 years after the author's death, written works in the UK are no longer covered by copyright law. Um, but do bear in mind that international laws do differ. Um, so you need to check the, the law of where you were based and where the work was published. Um, also, within UK copyright law, rules for different materials differ. Um, so, for example, broadcasts are protected for 50 years from the date that the broadcast was made. Um, so keep in mind what sorts of material it is. Um, but when materials are no longer covered by copyright, they're termed to be in the public domain, um, and then you would be able to reuse them. Um, so it's just keeping in mind those different elements. Uh, I'm just trying to keep up with the chat here as well. Um, yeah, the US law reprints of even very old text can be protected by publishers. Yes. So what we're talking about here is the original text. Um, so for example, um, Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen's work, Pride and Prejudice, it's obviously been more than 70 years since the author's death. The original text of Pride and Prejudice is no longer in copyright. However, for example, the Penguin third edition of Pride and Prejudice that were published in 2010, I'm making this up, but that would be protected by copyright as that individual work so you couldn't go and make a scan of the entirety of that penguin edition because that edition that entity itself of that book is covered by copyright it's the original Jane Austen text that would be out of copyright that you would be able to reuse um so make sure that you're separating that distinction in your mind so yes like newer ad adaptations um a film, for example, of a work that's out of copyright wouldn't be out of copyright. Um, so make sure you're using the the version that is out of copyright if you are making use of this um, kind of aspect of copyright law. Okay, now the final one today before we're going to wrap up. Um, no one will know and it will help my students, so it's fine to use. Um, so... The use of a work is uh, you're going to be copying some material no one will know it's going to help your students to share that material with them and um, so it's fine to use it's just kind of a, a final point to end up on really rather than a, a specific question although again this is something that we do get asked fairly regularly um but as you've all mostly said, the answer to this would be no. So just some general points to, to finish up on. Um, again, think about if you had written the work and you would want others to respect it. Um, it can affect people's metrics in terms of downloads and views, etc. as well, if you are not directing people to the, the version that might be available online. Um, so think about that if it was something you'd written as well. Um, also, Within institutions, we do have to manage the risks um, while individual risks. So we say here, you know, no one will know. Individual risks are quite low, but there could be serious reputational and financial ramifications on an institutional level. Um, if lots of this kind of reuse was happening and um, that wasn't reported and wasn't fair. Um, I did just want to say, though, that when you are developing teaching materials, especially, and you know that there's a work that is really um something that could help your students and there might be a situation where it is difficult to share or difficult to share as much of it as you want to. I know that it can be quite frustrating, um, but 
Um, usually the way that licenses and copyright exceptions and these kind of things work, usually there is a way to get at least some of the content um, to your students. And if there isn't a way, it's usually for quite good reason um, in terms of that kind of putting yourself in the, in the shoes of the copyright owner, thinking about what that author or the creator um, deserves for their work. Um, and really just thinking about copyright is there to protect creators. Um, that fundamentally is what it is there for. Um, and it is also there to, in because of that, it becomes an enabler of creativity because it's there to protect those creations, to give the attribution where it's needed, to enable people to build upon work in a way that a creator wants them to. So all of those things you spoke about, about giving authors control and um, allowing authors to maintain control over their work, you know, licenses and images in a different way, licensing uh, figures in a different place, all of it is about allowing creators um, to be in control of how their work is being reused and built upon and developed upon. And this is really what academia is all about. So thinking about copyright in those terms, rather than it being a frustration or a restriction, um, helps to, to show what copyright is there for. Um, and yes, sometimes uh, Sarah publishers can try to take advantage of copyright ownership, but that's where things like rights retention are really helping to combat that and helping to give that control back to the creators, which is what copyright was intended for initially when it first began. Okay, so thanks for sticking with me today. I know it's been a lot of me talking and quite a long, uh, long session, um, but I hope that you found that helpful. Um, if anyone does have any further questions, thoughts or ideas, um, I'd be really happy to hear them.